same time time zone oh, and yeah. kyoto with uh distant indonesians uh, time zone
Uh, Oke, okay, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the COVID-19, the lesson learned from Japan and Australia webinar. Uh, especially for our special speaker, Prof. Anu Ramohan from Australia and from Prof. Takuro Furusawa from uh, Kyoto. Uh, we are very grateful to have both of you uh, today. So uh, this is the special event uh, as a part of the 64 uh, Hassan University commemorating Commemoration Day celebration. And it will be the last event this year. So let me introduce myself as a moderator today. I am Joko Hindarto from the De Department of Community and Family Medicine, Faculty of Medicine Hassan University. And this afternoon, we will learn from uh, our two uh, neighboring country in the north and in the south, Japan and Australia, about their experience and also their future perspective on how to manage this pandemic. Uh, we can say that uh, Japan and Australia have a good achievement related to the COVID-19 control from the health aspect. The number of cases and also the mortality rate in Japan and is one of the lowest uh, in the world even though Japan has a, uh, the higher elderly population as a risk factor for the COVID-19. And as Australia also, uh, overall, we can say that Australia can manage this pandemic uh, well, uh, even though they still have a hard battle in the Victoria state. Yeah? And, but uh, when we talk about COVID-19, it is not only about the health problem, but it's, it is also uh, impact all aspects of our life as a human, as a society, and also a country. So this is, uh, will become uh, our uh, focus discussion today. So before we invite our speaker to deliver the lectures, I would like to invite Prof, Prof. Nasrul Masi, uh, the Vice Rector of Innovation Research and Partnership at the Hassan University on behalf of uh, Rector Unhas to deliver the opening speech. Uh, Prof. Nastrum, uh, maybe Prof. Nastrum is not, uh, is not uh, with us yet. So, okay, uh, maybe we will give Prof. Nastrum later uh, a chance to uh, give him a speech. And uh, today we will have two session the first session is a, a lecture session from uh, our speakers, and the next session is a discussion. So be, uh, if you have a question or comment during this, this speech, uh, please uh, post it in the chat room, and then uh, we'll convey it later, uh, later to, in the discussion uh, to the speakers. So, uh, okay, maybe we will go directly to the lecturer, to the speaker. So before uh, the lecture, I would like to make uh, a short uh, introduction about our speakers uh, this afternoon. The first speaker is uh, uh, Professor Anu Ramohan. Uh, she is a professor at, of economics at, and the associate dean international for the faculty of arts, business, law, and education at the University of Western Australia. She is also a senior fellow in the Australia Indonesia Center and her research is focused uh, mostly on understanding the relation uh, of socioeconomic and health uh, that can influence maternal child uh, health, gender, and food security. Uh, his uh, focus research, particularly in India, Indonesia, on, and also in Myanmar. And the next speaker is a uh, will be Professor Takuro Furusawa. Professor Takuro Furusawa is a professor at the Graduate School of Asian and African Area Studies, Kyoto University, Japan. His research interests include uh, human ecology, global health, and Southeast Asia Area Study. Uh, professor Furusawa is a, also a medical doctor. And then uh, he is a not new college for us in Hasari University. He first visited UNAS in 2011, and since then, we have uh, several collaboration together with the uh, UNAS scientists and uh, UNAS scholar. And our discussion is uh, uh, 
Uh, Sudirman Nasir, he is a lecturer at the Faculty of Public Health Hasanuddin University and also a senior fellow in the Australian Indonesia Center. So I think this is enough for the brief uh, introduction. I want to invite the first uh, speaker, Prof. Prof. Anura Mohan, to deliver uh, the lectures. Uh, your time is uh, 20 minutes, uh, Prof. Anu. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pak, for introducing me. Um, can I please share my screen? Yeah, you can directly share your screen uh, because uh, we will yeah. we already make you a, a co-host. Okay. Um, thank you very much for um, inviting me to give this lecture. It's a great honor. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Australia's COVID experience, but I'll uh, touch upon Australia's um, experience mainly from an economic perspective and the fact that we have low case numbers. So to begin with, uh, Park, you already talked about this. As you can see from this graph, the um, COVID pandemic is obviously a big major shock to the global economy and it has disrupted all our health systems and also our labor markets. And nearly every country in the world has been affected. But as we can see from this graph, we see that Australia and also Japan have, have not been affected as badly as other countries like um, the United States, Brazil and India. And we see down here that Indonesia and the Philippines have also been affected, but not as bad as um, other our neighbors in um, India and the US, which is, um, so if you look at the Australian experience, so, so the first Australian case that we had was in late January, when we had a return traveler from um, Wuhan in China. So at that time, we didn't realize that the situation would become this bad, but the Australian federal government introduced border closures for everyone coming in from China other than Australian citizens. So on, for, in the first week of February, Australia introduced border closures for anyone coming from China. So, and then what we saw here, we see that the case numbers start to spike. And this was because people were not coming at that point just from China and they were overseas return travelers from other parts of the world that were also um, had high COVID cases like the United States, Italy, and at that point also from Singapore. Um, so what we see here then that in March when the cases started to increase and at that point, most of them were overseas return travelers. The Australian government stepped in and introduced um, border closures for citizens from all the countries. So no one could enter Australia except Australian citizens. And Australian citizens were also not allowed to leave the country without getting an exemption. So the first thing we did was the government, the federal government introduced border closures. Um, and then what we also saw in Australia is at that point, um, we also saw that individual state governments introduced border closures for their own states. So for example, we are in the state of Western Australia and no one from outside Western Australia can enter this state without an exemption. And we, don't we can't leave the state without an exemption. So that was the first travel related um, bans that were put in place. The other thing that the government did was they introduced a, um, social welfare measures to, um, to deal with people that lost their jobs and industries that were closed. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so what we see here is if you look at confirmed cases in Australia, as you rightly pointed out, um, we have very low cases, but we see that the cases in the state of Victoria have increased quite dramatically in about June. 
So again, going back to this chart, we see that numbers started to decrease quite dramatically and then have increased, but most of the increase is happening in Victoria. And the problem at this stage was that up until this point, we were not that worried because we thought that all the cases coming in were mainly coming from overseas travelers in cruise ships. And for them, we put them in hotel quarantine for two weeks and but at the government expense. But what we see here in Victoria is around June, there were some breaches in the hotel quarantine. So some of the security guards or the people working in the hotels contracted COVID and took it back to their families. So that's how we then see that there is a start of community transmission in Australia. But because our borders were closed in, in um, Western Australia, in Tasmania, and in the Northern Territory and South Australia, we saw that these states had very low incidence of COVID, but because New South Wales uh, shares a border with Victoria and there was no border closure there, we see that some of the COVID cases did escape from um, Victoria. So if you look then at COVID cases by source of infection, we see that with the exception of Victoria, where most of the cases now are community transmitted, but we don't know the source, uh, and they are putting efforts towards contract tracing. We see that in all the other areas, most of it are basically travelers, Australian citizens who have returned, who are in quarantine, so they are not actually spreading it in the community. So, um, the main problem that we've had in Australia in terms of deaths have been that most of the deaths have been concentrated in um, aged care homes and nursing homes. And these are elderly people that typically have comorbidities. So again, what is happening is people in the aged care homes, the workers are possibly, you know, the source of the transmission, but most of our deaths are happening among very elderly people in the 80s and 90s, not so much in the young population. And again, you can see that most of the deaths are concentrated in two states. So what did the government do in terms of economic stimulus packages? Um, so the first thing, the government closed the borders and they also shut down many um, sectors, like they closed down restaurants, pubs, clubs, they shut down music venues, they shut down um, sporting activities. And so many, many workers lost their jobs. So to deal with this, the government introduced uh, what we call the job keeper payment. So the businesses that lost more than 30% of their revenue were able to access government subsidy if they kept the worker in the job. So for example, the tourism sector was very badly affected in Australia. Retail sector, international education was affected. But to show, to be able to access the job keeper payment, the business had to be a small business like a restaurant or something like that. Um, Industries like um, the universities were not able to access um, the JobKeeper payment because we are so big. Um, in, international students were, our revenue fell, but not by 30%. So the big airlines, our, um, Qantas was affected, our national airline was affected because more than 20,000 Qantas employees lost their jobs. So the JobKeeper payment is a way of giving the, people that lost their jobs a supplement of 1500 per fortnight, which is Australian dollars for up to six months. So this was introduced in March and it was supposed to be till the end of September. But in July, the government announced an extension of this program to be till the end of March. So the government is providing income supplement to those workers that lost their jobs and um, so this is just a JobKeeper allowance. 
In addition to that, we have another allowance called the job seeker allowance. This is for businesses that are completely shut down. So they have no prospect of opening up. So these workers cannot get go back to the jobs that they lost. So the job seeker is for people that are not going to be able to go back to their jobs. It's just a income supplement that we have like unemployment benefits. So we see that we um, job keeper was a big proportion of the government support. Uh, in addition, they increased social assistance programs. Um, this was at the federal government level for all the states. And they also allowed people to have early access to their superannuation or their pension entitlement. So because most of the sectors that were affected were young people, they, they were able to withdraw up to $10,000 from their pension accounts. This was simply done so that people were able to um, have a way of paying their mortgage or their rents. In addition to these government supports for, from an economic perspective, um, initially when we had the first wave of COVID, um, our supply chain was disrupted because we were so reliant on China for PPE equipment, masks and so on. Um, we didn't have enough supplies. So and the other um, thing the government did was we set up a national stockpile and we increased our capacity for ICU. We introduced, uh, we sought and got, now we've got capacity for 7,000 ventilators. We have ordered 220 million masks. So in Victoria, for example, they made it mandatory for people to wear masks if they, they were to go, in, go out. And the government supplied free masks for health workers or workers in vulnerable occupations. Additionally, about 17, uh, sorry, about 15 to 16,000 nurses were trained to work in ICU units. So what we did was, in addition to these um, economic supplements to help the um, people with, uh, who lost their jobs, the government at the federal level also um, made a lot of effort to help with the um, health related aspects. And they also supplied um, what we call the Australian Defence Force to help to ensure that people were compliant with social distancing and so on. So this was done at the federal level. Um, individual states, because we closed the borders, have their own different um, Rules. So, for example, I'm sitting here in Perth in Western Australia, which is, relative, is completely COVID free at the moment. Um, we are free to go where we like. There's very little um, social distancing, except uh, there are some social distancing venues on, um, on venues, but our university has opened. Students can come back onto campus. You know, movie theaters are open. It's Life is almost back to normal here, I would say. So um, then turning to the economic impacts of COVID, finally, what we see is that, of course, Australia is emerging from the pandemic a lot sooner than we expected and at significantly less economic costs than we expected. But what we see is that the unemployment rate in the country has gone up quite a lot and we have a huge debt national debt. So unemployment is anticipated to increase till up to 10%. And Australia has, you know, entered into a recession, which is our first technical one since 1991. And the closure of international borders is affecting Australia quite badly. And particularly in the tourism and education sectors, and the sectors that were most affected in the first wave were hospitality, like cafes, restaurants, and so on, because they were only allowed to have takeaways. And then air travel, tourism, creative arts, entertainment. And that is now having a flow on effect on the manufacturing sector. Um, Australia didn't have a big manufacturing sector, but um, it's having a flow on effect on construction and supply chain. Um, so I would say that 
Australia has managed the crisis relatively well, but the big challenges we face now is how do we open the economy? How do we open the, you know, the states are having discussions where it's become a bit political, where they are not prepared to open the um, economy or open the borders. So how do we safely open the borders in a way that's not leading to health effects? Um, I think with that, I might just stop here, Mark. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Anu, for the insightful uh, presentations. I think um, uh, all the country in the world also face the same problems, uh, raising the question how they open the economy, how they open the state. And then uh, I think this is very interesting. Uh, and then maybe I will go first to the uh, next speaker so we can get uh, like a whole uh, perspective here. So I will invite Prof. Uh, Furusawa to uh, deliver the lectures. Uh, your time is at 20 minutes, uh, Prof. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to, it is my great pleasure to deliver my talk, my talk through Zoom today. and. Yeah, I would like to thank organizers. Yeah, I, yeah sorry to say, I, I misunderstood the invitation invitations and I prepared a 30 minute presentation. So, but yeah, I will skip uh, some of my contents. So yeah, let me share my... Okay, can, can you see my PowerPoint slide? Yes, yeah. yes sir. Yeah, so I titled my presentation as Science Policy and the Society of Japan under the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, so yeah, first of all, I would like to clarify my position. So I am neither involved in Japanese policy or strategies against the COVID-19 or as a specialist on the COVID-19. So I today, I, my aim is to share information about the general situation of the COVID-19 in Japan and to provide information for us to think uh, what we can learn from this pandemic. In the beginning, beginning I talk about the time series trend in Japan. So this slide shows the number of positive cases per day with dates of important political changes. So first case was identified on January 16, and the first death was confirmed on February 13. Then the number of positive cases uh, gradually increased. On February 27, Prime Minister Abe requested all primary, secondary, high schools to close their class voluntarily. After a few weeks, the number of cases gradually decreased. At that time, we caused this small peak as the first wave of, because we did not know what would happen in next weeks. On March 7, local and central government started to require people to avoid three seeds, as that is avoiding gathering people in closed environment. Until this time, Japanese strategy looked successful. However, in March, huge number of Japanese who study abroad or work abroad returned to Japan because other countries started to lock airports. Among the huge number of people returned, a lot of inf infected individuals are also returned. We did not recognize that the situation of Italy or other European countries are so bad at that moment. After a number of positive people returned into Japan, the real first wave started as a dramatic increase of positive cases in Tokyo. Governor, governor of Tokyo Metropolitan City, Metropolis uh, Yuriko Koike requested 
Zushuku in Japanese, Zushuku of people, that means stay home voluntarily. On April 7, Prime Minister Abe declared the state of emergency in Tokyo and six prefectures. This state of emergency expanded to all Japan on April 16. The positive case then dramatically decreased and the state of emergency left until you know, lived on May 25. Then politicians used to, started to use such terms as new normal or with corona. These words reflected that we needed to normalize economy by going back to the normal life while the coronavirus is not totally eliminated. Then after a few weeks, after we began to live new normal, right? The positive cases started to increase again. So this is the start of the second wave. However, political responses were minimal for the, the second wave. No state of emergency anymore. Even on July 22nd, government started economic stimulus package called Go to Travel. In this package, government financially support people's domestic travels to help economy of tourism, restaurants, and others. So after this, infection expanded more and more. However, the peak was achieved in the end of July to the beginning of August, and the patient decreased day by day until today. So this is the general situation. It, and you may wonder why the government do not declare a state of emergency nor took strong actions for today. I mean, for second wave. So this slide shows a number of PCR tests by per day. After the expansion, the equipment and the technicians for PCR tests were prepared. Actually, in February, March, April, the epidemic was beyond the capacity of PCR tests in Japan. After the end of first wave, the PCR test capacity was raised. Therefore, a much larger number of PCR tests are performed today. And this is a reason behind the increase of positive cases. Uh, this slide shows the number of deaths because of the COVID-19. As you see, the number of deaths are not so large today. In, I mean, in the peak is lower in the second wave than first wave. There are two reasons. The one is the medical capacity was raised today. And the other is more cases of younger generations with no symptom or with asymptomatic are also included, included in the patient. So, so this low mortality uh, reassures us. So next, I introduced a preparedness in Japan. Actually, Japan did not predict the COVID-19, but predicted the pandemic of the novel influenza. Up, there are act of special measures for pandemic influenza and new infectious diseases, preparedness and response was approved by, by the, yeah, the diet and issued in 2012. So this law was raised revised in this year to adapt the COVID-19. So among a lot of strategies related to this law, I explain one figure in materials of cabinet decision in 2013, seven years ago. This figure show concept of Japanese responses to the novel influenza and also the COVID-19. So in this graph, Y axis is for the number of patients and X for time. As the nature of infectious diseases, the patients increase geometrically and achieve the peak and then decrease according to time. But there is a limit of medical capacity. If the number of patients exceeds this limit, medical services or medical system itself collapse. If the collapse of medical services happen, the situation is uncontrollable, as in case in Italy, USA, and probably in Indonesia.
So therefore, strategy is how the geometrical increase is suppressed under human control. So one is border protection to make entrance of the virus delay and make the transmission delay. So this is earning time strategy. So during the earning time, medical capacity is to be raised. On the other hand, several measures are also taken to make the peak delay and low. So in this strategy, even if the patients increase geometrically, the situation is under human control. So that is, that is why still Japanese government believes our situation is under control. As these posters uh, represent Japanese strategy, not only for the COVID-19, but also influenza and other common infectious diseases, coughing manner and wearing masks in order not to transmit the virus to others, and washing hands to avoid infections. So this is just a very customs, but th this custom is very common in Japan even before the COVID-19, because we have been familiar with the influenza and other virus infections. So next, I talk about unique stories for the COVID-19 epidemic in Japan. It was interesting that scientists, especially epidemiologists, became popular in Japan. Professor Ostani, Professor Nishiro, and Dr. Omi are the most popular scientists today. Actually, this photo was cited from a special issue of Japanese media named Bungei Shunju, saying fate of Japan was entrusted on three researchers. Um, I especially would like to introduce Professor Nishiura. Now he is at Kyoto University. I introduce him as my respect because he is young and the same generation with me. He has been the world leading epidemiologist and genius of mathematical modeling. He unintendedly became popular as a scientist in front of public communication. He issued important warning messages to the public through the government, press conference, SNS, and others in his sense of mission to stop the COVID-19. So by these scientists, a number of facts are are scientifically found, and those findings were take, integrated into Japanese policy. So this is about the unique characteristic transmission pattern. The left side is example influenza and other common infectious diseases. In this case, the virus is transmitted from one patient to two or more individuals continuously. One to, one to others. However, the researchers have found uh, that COVID-19 is different. Only one in five patients, regardless of severity, establish transmission to other individuals. In only some cases, the transmission was made to a number of individuals. In this figure, this patient transmitted to five others. But among the five, these four did not transmit it to any more. Only one transmitted to another one. Then this person also transmitted to only one person. But this person transmitted to five others. So this, in some cases, this happened, but most cases, transmission didn't didn't, was not established. So this finding suggested how important to control the cluster and the effect of cases as a, yeah, and cluster, I mean, the effect of cases other than the cluster is less influential. So another scientific strategy is cluster tracing or contact tracing. So surveys in many countries can be called as prospective strategies. If you find a positive cases, case, health officials will trace those who are contacted by the case and monitor occurrence of 
further infections afterwards. This is prospective strategy. However, survey in Japan is called retrospective, retrospective strategy. In this case, if you find the positive case, the health officials will trace back the activities of the patient and identify the place where the transmission happened. So not trace forward, but trace backward where the transmission happened. So maybe in some cases, another patients are also be back to the same place, place of infections. Once the place where the transmission happened, they yeah, so the health officer will identify the place of the cluster. Once the place was identified, the health officer will contact and perform the PCR test of those who were in the same place, regardless whether other individuals had the symptom or not. So through these scientific studies, three sheet strategy was taken. A professor Nishiura and others found that transmission in closed environment are much more different from other cases. In this figure published in their paper shows that in other cases, patients, so darker color represent cases in closed environment and brown one represent other cases. So in other cases, the patient transmitted to almost zero. So no transmission to others or one. However, in closed environment, the transmission was made to one, two, three, four, nine, or even 12. So based on this finding, the three sheets strategy was issued. So about three sheets, Closed spaces with poor ventilation, crowded places with many people nearby, closed contact settings such as close friends conversations. And Professor Nishiro also made an important uh, calculation. He called himself as Hachiwari Ojisan, literally meaning 80% middle aged man. So this he insisted that 80% reduction of human to human contact will terminate the COVID 19 epidemic in Japan soon. So, this is the result of his mathematical calculation. And following his, when he, after he encouraged to reduce 80% reduction of human contact, many measures are taken. So, this is one example that a private company, a group, are uh, issued based on their big data analysis of flow of smartphones. These companies provide us every day about the how much percent of human contact we use. So this graph shows the human flow in Shibuya Center Gai, the most crowded place in Japan. Actually, when the time during the state of emergency, the human flow in Shibuya was actually are reduced to about 20% 20, 20 before the emergency period. But from here, I would like to introduce some experience of people in society in Japan. So first of all, the state of emergency of Japan was much different from other countries. Many countries use legal force to reinforce lockdown. But the Japanese government did not make law of such legal force because, our, because of our rigorous to militarism in World War II. Japanese have allergy about the situation that the government has strong power to restrict human rights or restrict human daily lives. Constitution of Japan also restricts the power of the government. So that Therefore, Japanese state of emergency was made without lockdown or legal force. So everything was made a season of voluntarity and according to request, only request by the government. So this news article written by Dennis Nomir in science best describes the Japanese situation, I think. 
Yeah, I will read this article. So with this Japanese approach, we were able to control this infection trend in just 1.5 months. I think this has shown the power of Japanese model. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe declared at the press conference yesterday evening announcing the lift of the state of emergency. Japan's national and local governments do not have the legal power to impose lockdown measures, but authorities ask people to stay home as much as possible. Companies still allow working from home and bars and restaurants to close or serve only takeout. Based on modern, members of the advisory committee asked people to reduce their interactions with others by 80% in order to bend the curve. So this yeah, article was issued in after the first wave. So this didn't uh, reflect the second wave, but the situation is, yeah. So here I want to share some of my photos. So this is the photo taken during the state of emergency in my home. So Zoom lecture became popular. A primary school rented PC for each pupil. My children took a course through the PC. And so this photo is taken when I delivered the Zoom lecture. I made Zoom lecture in, in a very small terrace of my apartment room because the housing environment of Japan is bad. But because my room was occupied by two monsters during the school closure, so I had no place in my home, so I, can, I was allowed only in the terrace. But now life is recovered, children can play football. So during this period, Japan, a uh, jishuku is become popular term in Japan. So jishuku is Japanese concept, Japanese mentality and the difficulty to be translated into English, but it can be said as self restraint or restrict, restraint myself or yourself. The jishuku of going out is to restrain myself to go out voluntarily. So jishuku of celebration, jishuku of travel, jishuku of meeting friends, jishuku of homecoming, jishuku of even meeting old parents. So yeah, because as I said, government has no legal force. So everything was made by people's voluntarily. voluntarily. So jishuku was made people's own responsibility. And another term become common in Japan is docho atsuryoku. It is also a Japanese mentality term, but can be translated as peer pressure or pressure to conform. So this is a news article published in Asahi Shimbun, one of the biggest newspaper in Japan, titled as Wartime Japan and COVID-19 Conformity offers some parallels. So I will read this article. So Japanese society since ancient time has relied on what is often disparagingly referred to as a nation's group mentality to maintain order, as any scholars will attest. But there are also strong echoes in the Japanese society functions today, noted writer and theoretical director Shoji Kokami said. Strong Peer pressure arose once the general mood in society was one of suicide missions as the only way to protect Japan. He said, likening that to the current situation over the novel coronavirus pandemic that led people, public officials, to call on the public to refrain from non essential outings and the businesses being asked to close their doors. Suicide mission here, here means a notorious kamikaze attack during World War II, when many young people made a suicide attack against the United Nations. So businesses, yeah, back to the article. So businesses that continued opening were targeted for criticism over social media, Kokami said. He added that the Japanese style organization and the society has always had a violent side that sought to survive by consuming the lives and happening happiness of each individual member. Uh, 
And also, I want to introduce another aspect. So this and um, not this is this photo is from one website of Japanese TV uh, station. Unnatural is Japanese te television drama on TBS starring Satomi Ishihara. I, I introduced this drama not only because I'm Satomi's fan, but also this drama reflected some Japanese mentality. So episode one was titled as Nameless Poison, Solve the Mystery of Continuous Unnatural Death. So in this story, the scientific investigation disclosed that the unnatural death was caused not by serial killer, but by spread of the novel coronavirus in Japan. So in this drama, coughing in mana, washing hands, wearing masks are encouraged to cluster transmission. Retrospective tracing strategies of closure are described. And also this drama described this epidemic induced panic of the society and the patients and the families are targeted for criticism and discrimination. But this drama was on air on January 12, 2018. So already two years ago. So there are some, yeah, so this drama uh, already predicted Japanese mentalities, what will happen when the pandemic uh, comes. So finally, I want to share some, is it okay? Kurosawa-sensei, your time is uh, five oh. minutes left, okay. Yeah, sorry, I made, how, how many minutes left? Five minutes. Oh yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, I can. I think I can complete my talk. So yeah, finally, I want to share some, explain, uh, add some information from historical perspective. So needless to say, all germs originated in nature. This is biological or ecological mechanism. So in January, Chinese team identified that the COVID-19 originated from that. As I study suggested, are there animals, but Anyway, this virus is from wild animals. As in review written by Wolf and others in 2007, germs such as rabies, Ebola, dengue, HIV, all are from wild animals. So differences was in the way of transmission and the evolution of the germs. But the transmission is made outside of nature. For example, HIV was spread to the world from in the forest of Africa through global network of transportation. And the COVID-19 expanded in urban environment such as sports gym, live music club, karaoke. So this uh, transmission, a uh, pandemic trans was happened in such an artificial environment. And I also include one that internationalization is countermeasure against pandemic. So one example is smallpox. Smallpox virus is only one germ eradicated from the world in 1980. So effectiveness of variolation, that immunization with materials taken from patient, human patient, known in ancient Indian medicine and traditional Chinese medicine. And the record of the first variolation in 18th century in Japan is learned from China, but this showed limited effectiveness and has strong side effects. But the first vaccine made from bovine sample was developed in first in human history by Edward Jenner in Britain in 1796. And von Siebold introduced a vaccine to Japan in 18. 23 by importing it, it from Batavia, Indonesia. So, so that the vaccine was developed in Britain and German Dutch doctor introduced the new vaccine from Indonesia to Japan until 19th century. So then later va mass vaccination law was built in Japan and uh, continued until 1976, but in, and in 1980, smallpox eradicated, but globalization, internationalization overcame the pandemic. Uh, now all of the airports are closed, but uh, we need to note that opposite toward internationalization is nationalization. So we need to avoid uh, nationalization of 
Japan and all the country. So freedom of internationalization. So in 1615, Sultan Alauddin, grandfather of Sultan Hassanuddin, told to a uh, Dutch VOC against request of their monopoly trade. He said, my land is open to all nations. God has made the earth and the sea and has divided the earth among men and given the sea in common to all. And decades later, Sultan Hassanuddin told so that all mankind could have the enjoyment. So yeah, even yeah, even Kingdom of Goa lost, but the spirit of freedom has survived in Makassar. So Unhas's anniversary can be Memorial Day for next generation war with freedom and unite again after the COVID-19. Yeah, so I hope more keep we can keep collaboration. Uh, Salamat atas DS Natales to Nampurun Pat, Universitas Hasanodi. Terima kasih. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Furusawa. And this is very interesting uh, lectures. It's cover uh, all the aspects in the Hasanuddin uh, uh, in, in the COVID 19 pandemic uh, in Japan. And before we move to the discussion session, uh, we will ask uh, Sudir Marnasir first to give us uh, some insight uh, the Indonesian perspective uh, of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Maybe your time is around 10 to 15 minutes, uh, Sudir Man, so please. So the host, can you unmute uh, Pak Sudirman, please? Uh, not yet. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Joko and also Professor Ramohan and uh, Professor uh, Furusawa. Uh, both uh, colleagues uh, who are working very closely with uh, Hassanuddin University in uh, various research collaboration in the last uh, few years. My role as a discussant uh, is to re-emphasize some key points uh, and also trying to contextualize the lesson learned from uh, Australia and Japan in the context of Indonesia. And I will try my best to make it as briefly as uh, possible. One uh, key words that I think appear very strongly from both uh, Furusawa and uh, Ramohan's uh, presentations this afternoon is the state capacity. Both Australia and Japan uh, demonstrate a stronger state capacity in uh, dealing with the pandemic uh, and also in mitigating the impacts or various uh, consequences of the uh, pandemic, either in health or in socioeconomic uh, aspects. And this state capacity also uh, differentiates uh, both countries uh, compared to uh, Indonesia. Both countries respond uh, much earlier than uh, Indonesia and also invest in a uh, health sector much uh, higher compared to Indonesia, including in preventative uh, medicine. Professor Ramohan also uh, briefly mentioned about uh, comorbidities. Uh, they uh, play a key role in uh, facilitating the fatality rate uh, related to COVID-19. And in this comorbidities aspect, we can also see the different level of uh, investment in comorbidities management between uh, Australia and Japan in the one hand and Indonesia in the other hand. Even compared to some neighboring countries in Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia's investment per capita to health is actually uh, much lower compared to neighboring countries such as Thailand and, and Malaysia. And it is lower in terms of uh, preventative uh, medicine or preventative measures. They actually play a key role in managing uh, comorbidities. Many of them are non-communicable diseases such as heart diseases or 
uh, diabetes mellitus and also managing risk factors such as uh, hypertension and, and obesity. Uh, I know that both Australia and, and Japan invest a lot in, in, in managing these non-communicable diseases in the last 20 years. And now they start to enjoy the benefits of investing in these preventative uh, measures. Prof. Ramohan also uh, emphasized the state capacity to address economic aspects of uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, in Australia, especially in, in economic uh, uh, sector. And we are uh, witnessing now how Indonesia's government is struggling to, uh, to, to provide that kind of economic uh, uh, mi mitigation. Indonesia's position as a middle income countries, of course, are, are, are much different compared to uh, state capacity of Australia and, and, and Japan. Another factor that also important uh, is uh, what uh, Professor Furusawa mentioned as uh, a science-informed uh, decision making. Uh, both Japan and Australia uh, also now enjoy or harvest uh, the benefits of investment in uh, uh, science uh, ecosystem that now play a vital role in both uh, testing, detecting, and also uh, uh, managing the uh, patients living with uh, COVID-19. And, and we start to see how uh, investment in two sectors, uh, strengthening the health system and also strengthening the science ecosystem uh, are the common uh, characteristic that uh, uh, enable some countries, including Australia and Japan and other countries such as Germany, Scandinavian countries or other countries in East Asia, such as Taiwan and South Korea, they enable them to uh, manage uh, the pandemic and the consequences of the pandemic uh, relatively well. One last important aspect that I would like to uh, re-emphasize as a discussion this morning is society's uh, capacity to, uh, to respond. In the latter phase of uh, Professor Furusawa's presentation, we uh, have some uh, opportunities or window uh, to uh, peep into uh, the fabric or the nature of uh, Japanese society in responding to uh, to the pandemic and to the government's uh, uh, policy uh, such as uh, uh, physical or social distancing and uh, large scale of uh, social restrictions at the peak uh, of the uh, pandemic. Uh, pressure to conform uh, as uh, one very important aspect of Japanese society is uh, also uh, demonstrated as a vital role in managing the impacts of the pandemic. And both Australia and Japan also uh, now uh, see the benefits of uh, investing in the so-called preventative culture or safety culture by uh, most society that enable them to mitigate uh, the effects of uh, the pandemic. This kind of uh, investment is very strategic and need to be done sufficiently and in a continuous uh, way before we can uh, enjoy the, uh, the benefits. And one last thing is uh, uh, political uh, unity that demonstrated by governments in both countries at national and subnational uh, level. We can see that uh, in Australia, uh, uh, not only a uh, federal government that play a fatal role in managing the COVID-19, but also the state government or city government, as well as uh, demonstrated in, 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 in Japan. So those uh, aspects uh, such as state capacity, uh, science-informed decision-making, uh, societal capacity to face a big shock or big crisis such as uh, COVID-19, as well as safety culture or preventative culture that long rooted in the social structure uh, of uh, society in both cities, I think uh, uh, also play important role that enable both countries to perform relatively well. Uh, a lesson learned that we in Indonesia should, uh, uh, should learn. 
before closing my my discussion one things that i would like to share is uh, not uh, uh, all uh, responses in indonesia are, are do we start to see some improve uh, uh, programs from the government and one uh, also uh, a strong uh, indication for our responses is actually community responses in the form of uh, social solidarity even though we are also facing some uh, part of the society who uh, show a low uh, adherence to uh, governments or to the public health authorities uh, uh, encouragement to employ safer uh, be behavior so there are a lot of things to to learn from each other and as Takuro Furusawa mentioned in the last slide, that the world or the countries in the region should uh, unite and work uh, together to tackle these uh, multifacets of uh, crisis in the in the form of uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. That's uh, my brief uh, discussion, uh, Dr. Joko, and uh, perhaps you can follow it up uh, through a discussion with the audience. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Sudirman. And then uh, I think, yeah, uh, one of the main uh, prominent or thing is uh, uh, the capacity of the country, the capacity of uh, society, yes, uh, 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 on how we uh, manage this uh, pandemic. So uh, before, um, we I have a several questions here for uh, Professor Kurosawa and Professor uh, Anu, and then uh, maybe I will uh, read some of the question. The the first question maybe uh, from uh, let me uh, from uh, Dr. Lili Isak from Ternate, uh, North Maluku. I think this is a. a, a Nice question. How the this country, Australia and Japan, manage their community in relation to educa educational activities at school and universities? Uh, maybe this is for the both uh, both uh, speakers. And uh, the I will add the second question. Maybe uh, regarding the vaccination. I mean, yes, uh, we. Uh, until we have the vaccination, maybe uh, we have still to uh, stay with the non-pharmacologic uh, approach, uh, social distancing and, and contact tracing and etc. So uh, this is from Triana from Kyoto. Uh, he wants to know the progress of uh, vaccination uh, development in Japan and Australia. And uh, uh, do you think the world will be back to the true normal after the vaccine arrives? Uh, I think this is for the both uh, speakers. Maybe uh, this is for the uh, first two questions for Prof uh, Anu and Prof Purusawa. Maybe I will go first to Prof Anu. So okay. Prof Anu, please. Uh, thank, thank you for the questions. Um, it's good questions. With regard to, I'll answer the first one, with regard to education. Um, like I said before, um, uh, each state in Australia has a different policy. Um, the school children have by and large been allowed to go back to schools in all the states except Victoria. And for the universities, what has happened is um, the university students, the international students are not able to come back to Australia. So what we have done is we've put online education for them and our students, uh, because of social distancing requirements, are not able to all be accommodated in our lecture theatres. So what we've done is all our classes are online, but for small, smaller classes, at least in WA, we are allowing students to come back onto campus. So, but school children have always been allowed to go back to schools. So that's not for, um, has, there's been no little, very little transmission from schools. Um, so is that okay? So with regard to this second question, shall I just answer it also? Okay, Yeah. please. So with regard to the second question about whether world will go back to the, where we were once the vaccination is um, 
found it's um as it's i think it's hard to tell at this point because we don't know what the implications are we don't know what the health um it's too short period to know what the um, side effects are for um, of COVID. We are hearing cases of people contracting COVID even after they've recovered. So hopefully we find a vaccine. We can just hope that we find a vaccine that will allow us to go back to where we were. But I feel that people might be a bit more worried about going back to where we were. And for many people who've lost their jobs, it will be very difficult to get back to, especially airline industry, and those, I think it'll be difficult, but we hope, we can only hope, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Anu. And then uh, maybe we, were, we also want to hear the uh, Japanese perspective on this uh, question. So for Professor Furusawa. Yes, thank, yes, thank you for good questions. And about first question about education in Japan. So about primary, secondary and high schools. So it's after they, the school closed about 1.5 months in March, March, February, March, and April. Mm -hmm. But there are some vacations in spring. But actually, the start of the school delayed. But uh, usually, those pupils have their uh, summer vacation period. So the beginning of school delayed, but uh, the pupils mm -hmm. lost their summer vacation. But uh, but the uh, the delay was minimum. And also, even under the state of emergency, as I showed my photos, those, those uh, children can have the course to, uh, to Zoom. So, yeah, so uh, from June, I think from the beginning of June or in the middle of May, all schools are returned to normal. And now uh, all children can go to school. But the situation of the university is not so good. Yeah, actually, all these schools, children can go to school and all yeah. uh, adults can go to offices. Yeah. But yeah. university is locked. Because yeah. in Japan, about some millions of university students, and uh, if they move to university, that may cause new expansion mm -hmm. of transmission. So that uh, rural means uh, local government do not wish to uh, that the university start. But recently, but under this situation, so the, the university students are very, how to say, under uh, not good condition because uh, university students, uh, when they graduated from high school, they have no celebration because of the, the, the COVID-19. And they had no time to say farewell to their friends in their home. But after they enter the university, the university campus is locked down. No, no class in the real classroom. They receive only lectures through Zoom or I mean, from through online. They live alone in their uh, rented apartment house. Uh, the, so I think, so now their, uh, how to say, mental health condition is really worried. And their new Japanese term called Corona Utsu. Corona Utsu literally meaning Corona depression. Mm. So uh, depression, uh, mental disorders, uh, it is said increasing in, among university students. And uh, the situation is same about international students as in Australia. So no international student cannot go, come to Japan or go back to their yeah. nations. And yeah, I, I, I myself is very feeling very, uh, how to say, Sorry about about uh, uh, Ibu Toriana. So she is studying in Kyoto now, and uh, so yeah, I think she wants to meet her parents in Indonesia, but she cannot go back to uh, Indonesia under this situation. So he she live in Kyoto, even in this situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that okay. is the situation about education in Japan. And the second question about vaccination is. Yeah, as you see, as you know, say it will take usually it will take ten years or more to develop vaccine. However, world uh, many countries and many pharmaceutical companies are now trying to develop uh, the vaccine. 
And actually, so some of the companies in Japan is also trying to develop, but the pharmaceutical companies in Japan is not so strong in the world. So the vaccination development in Japan is so great. So I think the leading companies are in UK and United States. Uh, so Japan government of Japan has uh, making negotiations to purchase the vaccine from those uh, companies in uh, UK or US. Um, yeah, because one special situation of Japan is yeah, if there is no COVID-19, so we have the uh, uh, Olympic and the Paralympic Games mm -hmm. in this year in Tokyo, Japan. But this was ex uh, postponed to next year. So government of Japan really wants to uh, yeah, make the Olympic Games next year. So I think government will try their best to uh, prepare vaccines and back, make the situation back to true normal life. But, uh, but I myself is not so optimistic about this situation. Yeah, I, we have no material to predict when this our well, life can be back to true normal, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I cannot say. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. Rusawa. Uh, in Indonesia, also, uh, actually, several times we, at, until now, we still closed our school and university, and then we try to uh, several times to open the the school, but it seems uh, it's not safe yet, and then it's rising um, the cases transmission in the several uh, uh, district, and then we closed again. And then uh, maybe before I uh, give uh, Dr. Sudirman to give us also some insight, I have uh, several questions here. Um, in the, this is the first one is from uh, Tao. Tao from, I think uh, Tao is my uh, friend from Kanazawa University in Japan. So uh, yeah, unlike Indonesia, uh, Japan and Australia is uh, facing the second, uh, I mean, uh, preparing for the second wave of the COVID-19 now. So uh, uh, what what is the explanation or the main reason of the second wave? Uh, I think this is uh, for the Australia and Japan uh, setting because you have a, a two different, uh, what is it, two different situation of uh, COVID-19. And uh, another question is uh, uh, from Ganis, uh, Ganis, uh, Dr. Ganis from Banda Aceh. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, about the uh, contact tracing in Japan, uh, because if we see the contact, the Japan approach is quite different to the other country because uh, uh, until now the uh, PCR test is uh, still uh, not too high compared to, let's say, Australia or the other country. But uh, Japan is more focused on contact tracing. And uh, how do you explain this and then uh, uh, this, this policy? OK, maybe this is, uh, uh, I think we go first to Prof. Anu, uh, please, uh, about the second wave. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, so in Australia's case, the second wave started through the um, through the hotel quarantine being breached. So remember I told you that we had very strict border closures. So everyone who came to into Australia had to stay in hotels that were in and in quarantine for two weeks. But because there was a breach in the hotel quarantine in the sense that people who worked in those hotels came into contact with the guests, they took it back to their households and that's how it spread the community transmission. So what was being managed in the you know, hotel quarantine was breached and, and that once it got out, as uh, Professor Furusawa has shown, um, it just spreads very rapidly, right? One person can spread to five different people. So it quickly spread. So yeah, I think that's the reason. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Anu. And then uh, to maybe Prof. Ruzawa, uh, about the contact tracing a policy in Japan is quite different to the other country. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, first of all, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the first question as a reason of second wave. It's oh, because yes, yeah. after the end of state of emergency, 
the people returned to wanted to return to normal life because they are already tired staying home. So, but in this process, and still many restaurants and many public spaces are, how to say, uh, for Jishuku that voluntarily, uh, uh, how to say, limited their operations. However, uh, yeah, firstly, such as drinking bars, uh, pubs, and uh, yeah. So in such places, these the, the small pubs and bars are uh, very, very small, close environment. That's the factors of three sheets. But they wanted to return to such uh, socializing social places. Yeah, so the, the beginning of the second wave was from such places. And another reason is more uh, patient in young generations. So the young generation cannot how to say, control their own active behaviors. So that, yeah, that was related to such a uh, and public environment. And so this may be related to second question about contact tracing strategy of Japan. Actually, yeah, and actually, as you know, COVID-19 has a characteristic that there are many, I mean, the majority of cases are non-symptomatic or is asymptomatic. So even if you get, even if you got infected, you may feel no symptom you experience. So especially in young generations, most, many has already infected, but most of them have no symptom. They recognize it. But even non-symptomatic, they can transmit the virus to others. Yeah, so if you feel any symptoms, you may go to hospital and receive the PCR test. But if you do not have such a symptom, nobody wants to, you may not go to hospital for PCR test. Yeah. So therefore, contact tracing survey and strategy is still under operation. So if there yeah, are so health officials, like the Puskesmas in Indonesia, we trace back the places and trace to the, those who are contacted and ask them to have PCR tests even without symptoms. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, Professor Furuzawa. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, maybe, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Sudirman, do you have to add something here? from this uh, four question from the audience. Okay, uh, can you unmute uh, Pastor Dirman, please? For the host. Hello? Okay, it's so the... Uh, to the host, uh, can you unmute? Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, just a very brief uh, addition to uh, Enu and Takuro's explanation. I suddenly remember one thing that also uh, I reckon uh, play a key role in enabling Japan and Australia uh, managing the pandemic relatively well is the solid uh, risk communication performed by the government at all levels national and sub, uh, national levels. This consistent and uh, uh, firm uh, risk communication enable the society to uh, employ a severe uh, and preventative measures much more consistently compared to uh, sporadic and unstructured risk communication that we face in, in, in Indonesia. Contradictory uh, arguments uh, or opinions from government officers at different level of governance are not uh, very prevalent in, in both countries, even though actually uh, the leader of both countries, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Japan and Prime Minister of Australia uh, categorized as uh, populist uh, leaders. But in the current uh, crisis, both demonstrate their leaning to scientific approach and to uh, risk uh, consistent risk communication that 
uh, I think strengthen the the perspectives and the awareness of uh, Australians and Japanese society to uh, prepare themselves at individual and family and community level to to mitigate uh, uh, the impact. I'm not saying that both countries uh, perform perfect uh, responses, but uh, those uh, three or four characteristics, uh, state capacity and science-informed decision-making, political unity, and also consistent risk communication are among other factors that uh, uh, facilitate their relatively well performance. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pak Sudirman. I think this is also uh, what uh, determine our uh, approach between this country. And then uh, Pak Sudirman is very well uh, uh, put it in the context that the communication is uh, also very important things. Uh, and uh, before I uh, read the other question, I have a, a question from Prof, uh, Prof Anu. Um, Australia is almost, uh, I mean, let's say uh, almost, uh, uh, let's say, control the pandemics and then we will fo uh, maybe focus on the uh, economic recovery. And then during this uh, economic recovery, we still have to make the balance, uh, balance between uh, health and also economics, because if you um, uh, focus to, into one side, maybe the other will suffer or, or otherwise. Yeah. So what's the, the Australia government plan uh, to, uh, to make the economy recover, but at the same time still uh, control the, the, the transmission of the uh, COVID-19? Okay, maybe also I will ask uh, for, for, for Frosawa uh, to uh, what Japan's uh, uh, perspective. Okay, please, yeah. Prof. Uh, thank Thank you, Pak. Um, so I think that's a very good question. Um, so there is a lot of tension between the business lobby, which is pushing to open everything. And we also have the, um, the lobby with the um, health lobby, which is saying that, no, we shouldn't open everything. So there is a bit of tension there. And it depends on who you speak to. From the government's perspective, I feel that so far the government has done a good job in protecting the lives of people, but I think people are now feeling that there is, it is becoming too much in the sense, we are seeing this in Victoria. I see that there is a question here. Um, there is a movement of people that are against lockdowns, protest movement mm -hmm. starting in Victoria because they also have very strict lockdowns. They have curfew, they have, you know, and they are being told um, that Till the end of October, they won't be able to go out uh, or, you know, there are strict lockdowns in Melbourne, so which is our second biggest city. And so we have got that. Um, so in terms of what the government is doing at this point, I think they're slowly trying to open sector by sector. So um, the um, HK sector where we saw most of the Australian deaths happening, they are being protected. There are restrictions on young people going there and they're doing random testing and there are so i think i think in one sense they're not they're trying to protect the age care sector but in the other sense they're also putting pressure on the states to open the borders so what is happening is um, one on the one hand we are seeing an opening of the economy slowly but and support but at the same time they are trying to you know see what we can do to slowly bring the economy out of out of this COVID, um, COVID induced economic issues. Because I think what we are worried about is we'll come out of this, but we are going to be in a bubble. We're not dealing with anyone from, you know, where there is community transmission. So we have to take steps to ensure that somehow we live with COVID for the next year and a half. And how do we minimize the health risks? How do we protect the economy, but more importantly, protect the health of our vulnerable groups. I think that that's what they're doing. It's okay, a hard uh, thing. Yes, yes. Uh, and then maybe from uh, Professor Frusawa, you want to add something here? Uh, because all I, uh, Japan also is like the other country is, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, have like a very uh, hard impact on economy. Okay, maybe Prof. Frusawa. 
<laughs> yeah, but I actually this holds a severe impact on economy of Japan. So and that's the reason why because uh, even if even there even the coronavirus not totally eliminated Japan, but Japan restarted economic activities. And uh, mm, yeah, but actually um, economic package of Japan for the COVID-19 for this year is, I mean, one year, but economic, ec how to say, economic stimulus plan for this one year is bigger than total budget spent for uh, nine-year recovery from 2011 Tohoku earthquake tsunami. But yes, and uh, another point is that Japan has very big uh, governmental debt. So Japan's financial situation is so bad. So Japan has about three times government national debt, uh, three times of uh, Japan's national income. So the, the Japan is in the worst situation of the economic condition in the world even before the time of COVID-19. But as Dilma suggested, that today's government is like a little bit like a populist uh, leaders. And so they, so that the leaders spent a lot of money for how to say, make people, citizens enjoy without thinking about the future of the Japanese financial situation. So, yeah, so I cannot expect the future, but the, uh, the future of the financial situation may be very, uh, maybe a tragedy for Japan. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, also uh, uh, several questions. Uh, this is maybe uh, uh, a little bit more uh, specific. There is a question from the Dr. Uh, Dr. Wayan Juliarsa from Palopo uh, regarding the how did uh, Japan and maybe also Australia uh, prevent or reducing the the health workers uh, cases because in Indonesia for the COVID-19 because Indonesia we uh, see that there are uh, so many uh, uh, health workers, doctors, and also nurses is dead because of these uh, diseases. And the second one is regarding the uh, public education from the government. Uh, the question is from the Dr. Tendriagi Malawat. Is there any, uh, what is it? Uh, like um, uh, people in Australia and, uh, or Japan is not believe in COVID-19 and then uh, make like uh, opponent mo uh, movement uh, to the, uh, health policy from the government. Uh, I think this is uh, maybe uh, who, uh, Prof. Frosa or Prof. Anu? Prof. Anu? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, good question again. Um, so, yeah, so what we do see is um, in terms of public education, the government had all a lot of messaging about social distancing, how to wash your hands, that type of message is constantly being shown on TV. It's shown on, you know, lots of signs everywhere. And we also have what they called a contact tracing app. They asked everyone to download the app. So there is a lot of messaging about uh, public education on contact tracing, on, um, on you know, on uh, social distancing, wearing masks in public areas, in, particularly in hotspots. Uh, but as you say, there is a big movement growing increasingly, which is against lockdowns, but which is also against um, vaccinations. There are a, wow. a, some people that are, have an objection to vaccinations. There are, you know, that, that is also another challenge. I would say that it's a very small minority. It's not a big group of people. Um, with regards to your other question about health workers being affected by COVID, we also had that situation here. We had um, health workers who were affected by COVID, but luckily um, they have not um, you know, been badly affected, but they did get COVID. We do have lots of examples of that. Yeah. Okay. So Prof. Anu, so I think we have a, a same uh, challenging also. 
uh, mm. between Indonesia and Japan regarding this public education. But yeah. uh, I, I want to add something here. How do you uh, make sure that the 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 people is follow the the health authority health uh, uh, officer uh, regarding the um, what is it the uh, health protocol uh, for the COVID nineteen? So in areas so, where they have the restrictions, I'll, sorry, did you finish the question? Or? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, so in areas where there are restrictions, we actually have the police walking around and there are severe fines for, you know, violating the restrictions. And maybe, you know, in Melbourne, for example, they have been arrests and so on. So yeah, there are severe fines for violating um, restrictions we are or even have people that try to escape from the quarantine hotels they have been fined mm -hmm. yeah so it's okay. it's strong strong penalties for violation of the restrictions okay uh, thank you very much prof uh, prof anu uh, to prof uh, furusawa maybe this is also the question because uh, japan has a little bit soft approach uh, there is no mandatory uh, what is it uh, mandatory for people to follow the health policy, but people in Japan is follow the policy. How do you explain that? Uh, I mean, uh, and also regarding the, the uh, previous question about the, is there any other movement that's, uh, uh, what is it, is an opponent for the uh, health protocol for the COVID-19? Okay. And yes, also the- Yeah, question. So regarding question about health workers, actually uh, health workers are facing this very, how to say, tough, situations and uh, yeah as i said the government of japan tried to avoid collapse of medical services and uh, however in some cases especially in the time of first wave in some parts in many places yeah actually uh medic collapse of medical services happen and uh, yeah but uh, Mm. Yeah, and also health workers are faced with uh, discrimination in such a Japanese society. Mm -hmm. So those uh, medical doctors, nurses, uh, can, may be infected with the virus. So the yeah, children of such medical workers are also, even small children, are faced with discrimination in their school, in some uh, new state. So the way the government and media uh, start tried to make images that such uh, health workers are heroes of society to avoid that maybe that is one uh, public education. Um, yeah, but actually, and another message for the government is the is don't go to hospital. It, because the hospital is one potential place source of the cluster and uh, the medical resources are limited so government says uh, even uh yeah even if you get any sickness please don't go to hospital so yeah maybe that was successful to avoid the severe collapse of medical services however since that so actually so uh Patients, the number of patients other than COVID-19 dramatically decreased. So now is the season for other virus infections, such as rota, rota virus and other infections, but almost no patient in Rikos because those patients do not want to go to hospital. So as a result, so most of the hospital or medical workers lost their source of income. So, uh, yeah, so maybe that is also another tough time. So many of uh, medical professionals lost their work and lost of their source of income as a side effect of the COVID-19. Yeah. Okay, uh, before I give uh, also a chance to uh, Pastor Sudirman to give us uh, some insight, uh, there is one question for uh, to Prof. Uh, Anu here um, from uh, Ibu, uh, what is it? Uh, from Ibu Novi Manurung, yeah? um, 
to Prof Anu. Yeah. yeah. You already read the question. Yeah. I, I replied in the chat. Yeah. Okay. So what is your suggestion and also your advice for us? Because uh, yeah, compared to yeah. Australia, Indonesia is very big. Yeah. I think okay. it's a really good question and it's a, it's hard one to answer, right? I think basically doing a lot of testing and contact tracing is the way to go. But I think for me, like one good example is Vietnam, right? Vietnam has managed to have a big population, very low cases and a developing poor country, right? So yeah. I think, you know, if you see that compare Vietnam and compare the US, which is a rich country, we can see that you don't need a lot of money to manage this. What you need is discipline and being able to do a lot of testing, having PPE, PPE equipment available and mm -hmm. contact tracing and having the capacity in the health system. So, so yeah. Okay, uh, this is uh, for, for uh, Ibu Novi. And then uh, I think, yeah, we're still struggling with this, uh, how to manage the COVID-19 because uh, uh, our number of testing is, is also compared to the other country, uh, compared to the total population is, uh, is still very, is quite low. And also the contract tracing also become uh, uh, one of the tough, uh, uh, what is it? Tough uh, uh, task for us uh, to uh, what is it? To uh, look for the uh, cases and then uh, okay. Uh, maybe I will invite uh, uh, Pak Sudirman. Uh, you want to uh, add something? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joko. I think. Uh... The last part of uh... okay, uh, <laughs> it's unmute again. Uh, okay, yeah, I think I will echo the last part of uh, Professor Ramohan's uh, explanation about the urgent need to strengthen the health system, and this is not just about the amount of money, but actually also how to. Uh, invest in more strategic ways. Some countries in Southeast Asia, such as Vietnam and Thailand, and also Malaysia, despite the uh, capacities, including economic capacities, of course, are uh, much lower compared to uh, Australia or Japan or the US, but they manage also to perform relatively well. And their economic uh, circumstances are more closer to Indonesia's uh, circumstances. So sharing a lesson learned from each country will be crucial uh, to enable countries in the region or to enable countries in the world to uh, tackle the pandemic or to get prepared for the next pandemic because there's no guarantee that this is the last pandemic that we will yeah. face in our lifetime. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pak Sudi. And then uh, now maybe uh, we will uh, make uh, some, uh, let's say, uh, a conclusion for our webinar this afternoon. So uh, uh, before we uh, end our webinar uh, this afternoon, I would like to uh, in fact, if uh, Prof uh, Purusawa or Prof uh, Anu uh, uh, maybe uh, still have a, uh, what is it, like a closing speech for us, because uh, what we want from our uh, webinar this afternoon is that we are not only uh, want to uh, know how Australia and Japan uh, manage their uh, pandemic situation, but also how we uh, use this knowledge and experience to uh, prepare our society to be resilient for the next uh, pandemic, as uh, Pak Sudirman Nasir uh, say. Uh, maybe uh, I will go first to uh, what is it? Uh, Prof. Furuzawa. Prof. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is like my great experience to share our. Yeah, our knowledge and to learn a lot from you. Actually, I just reminded just that when I first visited in Makassar for 
for explore any potential of the research collaboration. But at that time, I wanted I searched any uh, where there is PCR analysis available, but this is very limited in Makassar. So I imagine that uh, yeah, I know some technicians. Of, I mean, any some researchers in Unhas who are professional about the PCR. So maybe they are very uh, busy and have faced with the tough condition today. So yeah, I just wanted to cheer them up even during tough time. And and also I my another message is as the, the same as my last message in my presentation that to keep collaboration and keep and enhance internationalization even in this uh, tough time. So we have more uh, scientific collaboration or academic exchange may yeah. uh, maybe can be lead to better preparedness for further future potential pandemic. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much for uh, Professor Furuzawa. And maybe uh, from Professor Anura Mohan. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Park. So, yeah, so I just want to say thank you again for inviting me. And it was good to share my experience and also to hear from um, Prof. Furusawa about the Japanese experience and also Sudhi for the um, connection with uh, Indonesia. So you're, you're absolutely right. This pandemic has shown us that we all face common problems and we can work together to solve these problems. So from our perspective, we are already working with UNHAS on the Australia Indonesia Center collaboration project. We we'll also look forward to working with you on um, other joint programs for our master's programs and for maybe we can look at joint PhD cooperation or uh, research collaboration. And we are very happy to collaborate with UNHAS. I think we are just looking at signing the document at this point. So we are excited about this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much from uh, Professor Anu Ramohan. And uh, I hope also that the, the collaboration between UNHAS and Kyoto University and the University of Western Australia and the other institu institution in uh, Japan and Australia is still, um, what is it, uh, last uh, and longer. And then uh, Maybe for the uh, last speakers, I was I will also uh, invite uh, Pastor Manasi to give us some uh, what is it uh, the closing uh, comment for our webinar uh, today. Before I invite uh, Professor Professor Nastro Masti to uh, close our webinar this afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Joko. I think my uh, final comment is. Uh, to see uh, how Australia and Japan as uh, countries now facing aging population uh, in combination to the uh, COVID-19 uh, emergency. And uh, even though Indonesia's life expectancy is lower compared to Australia and Japan, but we are steadily uh, also moving into uh, aging uh, population with, uh, which is more susceptible or prone to uh, non-communicable diseases. Many of them are important comorbidities in relation to, to COVID-19. So learning from each other, uh, learning from both uh, successes and also shortcomings, I think is very important. And we can do that through uh, research and academic uh, collaboration that so far are uh, running very well between uh, Universitas Hasanuddin and uh, the University of Western Australia and also Kyoto University. And we are very uh, uh, fortunate to have uh, Professor Nasrum, the Deputy Director in International Collaboration, who will also provide a closing speech. And also, uh, of course, encouraging uh, partnership between uh, universities in the region. Thank you, Joko. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pastor Denman. And then uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, um, our time also is uh, very limited for this webinar, so uh, I will. I would like to invite uh, Prof. Nastrum to give us some uh, uh, what is it, insight here, uh, speech, and also closing our webinar uh, today. So, Prof. Nastrum. 
Profesor Nasrum. Okay. Uh, Thank you okay. very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Can you hear me? Very clear. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Prof. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Prof. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everybody. Especially our special guest, uh, Professor. Anu Ram Mohan from University of Western Australia and Professor Takuro Purusawa from Kyoto University. Uh, uh, I'm a, 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 a vice rector for research innovation and partnership from Hasanul University. My name is uh, Muhammad Nasr Masi. Actually, I'm graduate from uh, Kobe University in a medical uh, faculty. Uh, uh, especially uh, my 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 uh, specialist is uh, uh, clinical microbiology, and uh, I'm a uh, arrange one laboratory for diagnostic uh, swab uh, test in in Hasanuddin University Hospital. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, nice uh, discussion related with the COVID-19. Uh, I think uh, there is uh, many benefit for for us as a uh, as a, a university, even uh, actually, uh, we already arranged this kind of the same topic related with the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, lesson learned from the Netherlands. I think now, now we 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 have a, a another from another country, uh, Australian and Japan, uh, and uh, the topic related with the science, uh, science, science society and uh, government policy. Uh, aspect. I think this is very interesting and hopefully that uh, uh, in between UNHAS and uh, Australia and Japan, we can uh, increase our uh, collaboration uh, related with the, uh, yeah, especially for the uh, COVID-19 or, or another topic, I think. So uh, in Indonesia, as, I, as, as you know, that we have the same uh, uh, how to say, how to protect uh, uh, from uh, transmission of the COVID, like uh, you, uh, running, use uh, hand washing and uh, uh, use face uh, mask and social distancing. And for government policy in Indonesia, that uh, they uh, recommend us to do it a uh, lab uh, swab test, to increase a uh, lab test uh, uh, swab. And until now, According to the uh, more than uh, 200 laboratory in Indonesia, we just cover uh, every day around 30,000 until 40,000 uh, tests per day. So not like in, in Japan, maybe in Australia, maybe more than 1 million every day, as, as I know. So that's why we need to increase that. And uh, besides that, contact tracing and uh, isolation of the uh, patient or uh, uh, suspect in the hotel or uh, quarantine. It, this is uh, uh, okay. So, uh, uh, on behalf of university, I think uh, uh, Sanudin University, we uh, really uh, thanks to uh, Professor uh, Ramona Ramuhan and Professor Fursawa for this. Uh, your, to sharing your knowledge and uh, experience related with the COVID-19. So we hope that not only uh, in this time, but uh, hopefully that uh, Dr. Sudirman and Dr. Joko can enhance to maybe make it like a, a, a article in, in a review related with the, how the three country can uh, manage the, manage the COVID, uh, pan pandemic COVID in its country. So it means that this is the, uh, the beginning of our collaboration, that we can uh, write the paper in, uh, in, a, in maybe in journal for the uh, mini review related with that. Maybe there is a specific uh, uh, method or a, a government policy related with that. So I hope that this is still continue our collaboration and thank you very much for the, uh, all of your uh, uh, information and uh, thank you very much for the steering committee and Dr. Joko and Dr. Uh, Sudirman for arranging this uh, uh, webinar. So let's uh, uh, close this uh, webinar together with the say to 
uh, Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh So uh, thank you very much for all the speaker to Prof. Uh, Ramohan, Prof. Rusawa, uh, Pak Sudirman, Prof. Nasrum, and all the participants. I think our discussion this afternoon was uh, very uh, fruitful. And then, uh, yeah, Indonesia, uh, we, we learned a lot of uh, so many things from this uh, Japan and Australia experience on, uh, on this pandemic uh, situation. And then, uh, yeah. In Indonesia, we need all the assistance uh, to help us uh, contain the transmission of the virus and also to increase our capacity uh, and also how to uh, uh, to help us recover the, the economy. And then uh, there are uh, several uh, things that I think I must stress in this uh, webinar is um, the capacity of the government, the capacity of the society is must be, uh, what is it, uh, addressed very well. And then also the science driven policy. So this is also, uh, we need to uh, improve it in, in our, uh, yeah, our country in Indonesia. So, so I think uh, this is uh, uh, the last. So yeah, uh, hopefully the COVID-19 soon will be yeah will be relief and we found the vaccine as soon as possible, and then uh, yeah we can be uh, more stronger for the other pandemics in the future based on our knowledge and experience for this uh, current uh, pandemic situation. And to the all participants, wherever you are, stay safe and healthy. And thank you very much. Uh, see you for the next events. Goodbye from Makassar and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for Pramuhan and for Furusawa. Arigato sensei. Thank you, Joko. Thank you, Anu and uh, Takuro-san. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Terima kasih banyak Pak Safrullah, <laughs> Pak Rahmat, Kak Wahid. Oke, okay, acara terakhir ya. Pak Safrullah, terima kasih ya. Paling sibuk. <laughs> siap dok, siap.